It starts with a breath. The virus lodges in the mouth and throat, makes its way to the lymph nodes, and begins to migrate from cell to cell. Twelve days later, it's in the bloodstream, multiplying in the bone marrow and spleen. Symptoms appear. High fever, muscle pain, headache, and weakness. Spots appear in the mouth and throat, rupturing, releasing virus into the saliva. Next, it attacks the skin. A rash forms, then fluid-filled blisters on the face and torso, walking down the extremities. From there, it takes its ordinary, modified, malignant, or hemorrhagic forms. Death rates, depending on the form, range from 30 to over 90%. This is smallpox, a disease that appeared in the ancient texts of India and has been found in Egyptian pharaohs, a virus that ravaged ancient Rome and toppled the indigenous societies of the Americas, a plague so deadly humans have dedicated several gods to the disease, and it's one of only two diseases humans have ever eradicated. This episode is brought to you by the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota. As a parent, you worry about your child, so you should visit your nearest clinic for a wellness check, free for infants through young adults. You'll be happy knowing your child is healthy. Learn more at the links below. It's difficult to overestimate the impact of smallpox on human history. From killing monarchs to paving the way for colonialism in the Americas, the Pacific Islands, and Australia, it was a disease that, like tuberculosis, seemed like a permanent fact of life. In 18th century Europe, an estimated 400,000 people died from it every year, and most people got it during their lifetimes. Its high mortality rate for children, at times 80%, was a major factor in lowering lifespans. But that's the view from orbit, because on an individual level, this disease was even worse. Those infected needed constant care, meaning it easily passed to caregivers, wiping out whole families. And survivors experienced permanent effects, from deep-pitted facial scars, to the loss of eyelashes, to blindness. This was so common that ladies' etiquette books advised on how to properly console a friend whose beauty had been ravaged by the disease. The only guard against smallpox was a process called variolation, where a doctor would cut open the pustule of an infected patient, dry the extracted material, then rub it into a cut on the arm of a healthy patient. This procedure was brought to England in 1718 by Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who witnessed the procedure in the Ottoman Empire, where her husband was serving as the British ambassador. While Europeans had heard of the practice, Lady Mary became an advocate for bringing the procedure to England, having both her own children variolated and got permission to test it successfully on six prisoners at Newgate. By 1722, members of the royal family were being variolated. Now, variolation was not vaccination. It was giving someone a weakened version of full-blown smallpox, but it was better than nothing. In experiments at the time, about 2% of people died from the procedure versus the 14% of natural infections. But the infected person also became contagious, putting friends and family at risk and requiring a period of quarantine. In other words, it was both extremely expensive and only available to the rich, who could afford professional care and to stop working. One of those variolated was a teenage boy named Edward Jenner. And the procedure was the talk of the school. Everyone had an opinion, even the milkmaid, who said she didn't need it. Yeah, because you see, she'd already had cowpox, she said. And people who get cowpox never get smallpox. It was a statement that stuck with Jenner for decades. As he finished school, as he apprenticed under the great surgeon John Hunter, as he returned home to become a county doctor, and while fooling around with hot air balloons and zoological pursuits. Eventually, this offhand comment would lead him to develop something that would save more lives than any other discovery in history. In 1796, a milkmaid named Sarah Nelmus came to him, exhibiting signs of cowpox. Remembering the mention from his youth, he asked the young woman whether she'd ever had smallpox. She hadn't. Having studied both animals and people, Jenner knew diseases could pass between them, but cowpox was a mild disease, causing mere lesions on hands and arms, and also not very infectious person to person. Was it possible that an infection with the mild cowpox could provide immunity from smallpox? He decided to test it on James Phillips, the son of his gardener, who was eight years old. Now, that could be seen as wildly unethical today. But in Jenner's defense, part of it was likely practical. Smallpox was so endemic that children were the only people who hadn't had it at one time or another. And if he were right, this would be one child who would never have to face its horrors. We assume he had his father's permission, but it is worth mentioning that we don't know Philip's part of the story. So, he gave Philip's cowpox, then tried to variolate him with smallpox. No symptoms. The kid was immune. But not only that, he discovered that cowpox could be transmitted person to person, making vaccination much easier. 
And that was the term he created, vaccination, from his new Latin name for cowpox, which literally meant smallpox of the cow. He conducted 23 more experimental vaccinations, including on his infant son, and submitted a paper to the Royal Society. Now, Jenner was not the first to vaccinate with cowpox. It had been proposed or carried out a half dozen times already, but none of those incidents were published, studied, or publicized. Jenner, by contrast, made promoting vaccination his life's work. But not everyone believed Jenner's work. Not initially. Attempts to replicate his results sometimes failed due to specimen contamination. And because there were no standardized methods of vaccination, some doctors who tried the person-to-person -person procedure accidentally transmitted more than cowpox. Yikes. Imagine that awkward doctor's appointment. Congratulations! You're now immune to smallpox. Also, um, you now have, um, syphilis. And these unfortunate incidents, while more than one in a million, helped feed a strong backlash against vaccination. Some objections were religious. People who thought that vaccination interfered with the divine plans or polluted the human form with animal matter. Some objections were tragically financial, and some doctors objected to it because variolation was a lucrative procedure they didn't want to abandon. And of course, some objections were ego-driven, because who was this country doctor to tell people how to practice medicine? <laughs> Anti-vaccination leagues and societies formed, including a few with, let's just say, ill-informed positions. One famous political cartoon showed a cow's head emerging from people's bodies after getting Jenner's vaccine. Others claimed that the vaccine itself could cause diseases like syphilis rather than transfer them via contamination. But despite the opposition, Jenner worked to promote vaccination as safe and important. He freely shared the process with doctors abroad, sending it to America and France. Napoleon insisted that his troops be vaccinated, and even though he was at war with the United Kingdom, presented Jenner with a medal for saving so many French lives. Actually, Jenner was so respected in France that he was sent to negotiate the return of prisoners of war. In 1803, a Spanish expedition brought Jenner's vaccine to Latin America, the Philippines, and China, a humanitarian mission only slightly undercut by the fact that to keep the cowpox alive during the voyage, they had to enlist 22 orphans as successive carriers of the virus. But Jenner had spent so much time promoting vaccination that he had neglected his own medical practice, and his money began to run dry. Still, he set up a hut in his backyard, calling it the Temple of Vaccinia, where he gave out free vaccinations to anyone who could not afford it. Seeing how his public work had affected him, and seeing how he had not tried to profit from vaccination, in 1802, Parliament granted him £10,000 for his work, and then another £20,000 five years later. In 1821, he was appointed the physician extraordinary of King George IV, but died shortly afterward. Jenner's work, however, continued. In 1813, the U.S. Congress passed legislation ensuring the public had access to the vaccine and started to vaccinate its extremely vulnerable Native American population in 1832. By 1853, the vaccination was compulsory for infants in England, though opposition rolled that back in 1907. And opposition was not always peaceful. In 1904, a mandatory vaccination law in Brazil caused a revolt, and 30 people died in street fighting. In India, people often preferred variolation because the use of cattle in producing vaccine was at odds with the animal stature in Hinduism. But then in 1958, something amazing happened. A Soviet health minister asked the members of the World Health Organization to form a global campaign to eradicate smallpox. The U.S. and Soviet Union would end up donating 80% of the vaccine used in the effort, and by 1979, one of the greatest efforts of Cold War cooperation had yielded an amazing result. Smallpox now only existed in the lab. Less than 200 years after the first vaccine, smallpox was gone. Mankind can never forget that you have lived, read a letter of thanks Jenna received in 1806. Future nations will know, by history only, that the loathsome smallpox has existed, and by you has been extirpated. Fervent wishes for your health, Thomas Jefferson. See you next time, everybody. Once again, thanks so much to the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota for sponsoring this episode. As a parent, I imagine you always worry a little bit about your child. So that's why there's free Child and Teen Checkups. Bring your child to your clinic for a free wellness check. Your doctor will check hearing, vision, teeth, and offer wellness information for your child's age. Also, you can ask your doctor about vaccinations and help safeguard your child from preventable diseases such as tetanus, polio, and measles. So you can be happy knowing your child is healthy. And it's all completely free. Learn more at the links below.